Okay. Hello. Okay, let's start the second afternoon section. The next speaker is uh, Fernando Algarin. He'll talk about interplay of dynamic and explicit chiral symmetry breaking effects on a quark. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Fernando Serna, and now I'm going to talk about interplay of dynamical and explicit chiral symmetry breaking effects on a quark. But before starting, uh, I would like to send to the organizer to give me the opportunity to participate in this very nice workshop. Uh, this work here is in collaboration with Professor Bruno Benich. Um, <laughs> Chen Chen. It's not working, this. The pointer? Yeah. Ah, okay. Strongly. This one just to pass. Okay, okay. Laser. Oops. Yeah, it's working. Okay. Okay. I'm done. Um, I'm going to start my presentation talking about the subject of this workshop, which is mass generation in QCD. And as we know today, uh, no perturbative quantum chromodynamic is singularly characterized by two phenomena. Uh, color confinement, which is related to the empirical fact that color particles are not observed free in nature. And the most effective mass generating mechanism, which is driven by dynamical chiral symmetry breaking. The impact of this mass generating mechanism is evident in the light quark sector of QCD and plays an eminent role in describing why the nuclear mass is about two orders of magnitude larger than that of its three bird constituent. Then, dynamical chiral symmetry breaking uh, is the most effective, uh, is the most important mass generating mechanism for visible matter in our universe. On the other hand, for heavier quartz, uh, starting from the strange quark, the effect of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking uh, is gradually attenuated, and the bottom quark constituent mass is almost completely due to Higgs mechanism. Uh, the phenomenon of mass generating is encoded in the quark dyson schunger equation, which is a continuous approach to QCD. And the strength of this phenomenon is dominated by two ingredients in the integral kernel of the quark dyson schunger equation. These ingredients are the gluon dressing function and the dress quark gluon vertex. With this in mind, here we did the following exercise. Well, we investigate how the pattern of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking and relative effects between explicit chiral symmetry breaking and dynamical chiral symmetry breaking for a given flavor, depending on the simplification applies to this kernel. Uh, it is important to, to recall that dynamical chiral symmetry breaking is the dynamic mechanism 
which transform a light quark in the QCD action into a constituent quark. And explicit chiral symmetry breaking is because the fact that the different value of the quark masses in the QCD action uh, explicitly break the chiral symmetry. Uh, before I start to the idea of this work here, of course, I have to introduce what dyson schwinger equations are. Well, dyson schwinger equations are the equation of motion for green function of a given quantum field theory. Uh, we can use them to study the perturbative and no perturbative regime of QCD. Uh, they are an infinite tower of coupled integral equations. And as a consequence of this, uh, in order to have a treatable problem, truncation schemes are necessary. But in doing so, symmetries of the theory has to be preserved. OK, how I said, uh, the phenomenon of, of mass generating is encoded into the quark dyson schwinger equation. Then, in this work, we focus on this equation, which uh, the explicit form of this equation is given by this expression here at the top, where the first term is the free part, and the second part is the is called of the quark self, self energy that introduce quantum loop correlation to the quark propagator. The exact solution of this equation gives me the dynamic of the quark, which means all the possible ways how a quark uh, can propagate. Uh, this object here are the principal ingredient of this equation. Uh, the first one is the dress gluon propagator. The second one is the dress quark gluon vertex. This NF is the current quark bare mass. And this S2 and 1 are the quark wave function and quark gluon vertex renormalization constant, which depend of the renormalization point and of this lambda, which is a regularized mass scale. It is important to mention here that both the gluon dress gluon propagator and the dress quark gluon vertex also satisfy their own Dyson Schwinger equation. As a consequence, we have an infinite tower or couple equation here. By uh, from Poincare covariance and parity invariance, this is the most form that we can, the most general form that we can write the quark propagator, where this MF here is called of the ruling quark mass function, which is defined in terms of this uh, this ratio here, where B and A are scalar dressing function, and this object here, this it's, uh, F is called of the renormalization weighing function. OK? Well, how I said before, uh, the strain of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking is governed by two ingredients in the quark dyson schwinger equation in the integral kernel, which is defined by this contraction here, the contraction between the gluon propagator and the quark gluon vertex. The gluon dressing function is defined via the gluon propagator. OK, again, the main idea here is to gain additional insight of dyna in dynamical chiral symmetry breaking by studying the quark dyson schwinger equation uh, for different uh, interac gluon interaction and quark gluon vertex ansatz which I'm going to describe briefly in the next couple of slides. Well, uh, a model that can be used to realistic calculation in the framework of dyson schwinger equation uh, is given for this expression here, where from the left side to the right side, uh, the abelian approximation of the ward green takahashi identity had been used. This means that uh, a one loot uh, corresponds to neglecting contribution of the three gluon vertex to the quark gluon vertex. This calligraphic G is the unaffected coupling for the gluon. And in the leading truncation, uh, we employ this answer here that it's called rainbow leather truncation. 
And this additional renormalization factor here in this truncation is to ensure reno a multiplicative renormalizability of the quark gluon or the quark Dyson Schwinger equation. And thus, their <coughs> sorry. And thus, uh, the renormalization point independent of the running quark mass function. Okay. Well, to go, to go beyond the rainbow approximation, we treat here with the Balchu Berthe that also satisfy the wire green Takahashi identity that I, that I mentioned before. And this Berthe uh, implies, of course, uh, flavor dependent via A and B dressing function. Okay. <clears throat> uh, from the Wargreen Takahashi identity, we can write the quark gluon vertex in this form as a zone of a longitudinal and a transverse part, where the transverse part remains undetermined by the Wargreen Takahashi identity, and it is naturally constrained by this expression. Uh, we know that in general, in perturbation theory, a one loop. Uh, we can write the quark gluon vertex uh, in this form. <clears throat> okay, another answer that we use is a phenomenologi phenomenological answer that model the quark's anomalous chromomagnetic moment, which is given by this expression here. This, this phenomenological model introduces a transverse piece. And together, the Balchu Verde, we, we had now uh, a new full quark gluon vertex. But we know that in QCD, the quark gluon vertex also satisfies a Slanos Taylor identity, that it's a generalization of the wargreen Green Takahashi identity for the Noabelian case, and also leave the transverse part undetermined. Well, going in this direction, we use a novel uh, vertex, novel answered vertex, which is given by this expression here. And it is a simplified minimal model derived from transverse Slanov Taylor and constrained by perturbative QCD that satisfies multiplicative renormalizability. <clears throat> okay, in this, in this expression, No, 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 no. I left out some uh, relevant tensor structure. And what is the criteria? No, it's in order to, to have a simplified minimal model. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Where this G is the Gauss dressing function and this H0 is the leading form factor of the quark Gauss kernel. Uh, of course, it is possible to include a more form factor, but for the present um, purpose, uh, we neglected them, the, their contribution, and also we set uh, this form factor equal to one. Okay, now for the gluon interaction model, we use an interaction um, answer for the effective coupling that provides a good uh, meson and baryon phenomenology, and is given by this expression here, where the first part is an answer for the infrared part, and the second part is for the perturbative part. In all instance, for the perturbative part, we use this expression here. And for the infrared part, we compare two models, the Maristandi model and the King Chan model. The difference between this model is that the last one avoid the Q square factor and therefore lead to an infrared massive and finite interaction, which is consistent with lattice. Uh, for the case of the Slanos Taylor ansatz, we implement this model and also we use uh, make uh, the palette approximation for unquenched lattice regularized Ghost and gluon dressing function. Okay, going back to the idea or the main point of this, of this work here, uh, a convenient parameter to study 
dynamical chiral symmetry breaking uh, is can be used uh, this renormalization point uh, invariant parameter which is defined by this ratio here where this f sigma f is the constituent quark sigma term which measure the contribution of the explicit chiral symmetry breaking to the dress quark mass function and it is defined by this scalar matrix element and by using the hellman feynman theorem we can relate uh, this scalar matrix element in terms of the uh, consti euclidean constituent quark mass solution which is defined by this expression here okay but this ratio measure the effect of the explicit chiral symmetry breaking on the dress square mass function of course in the chiral limit this ratio must to must vanish and will improve with larger quark mass and for the case of the top quark for example this parameter is equal or approximate to one because the more of the mass mass of the top quark is because the heat mechanism well now this table summarizes the result for the euclidean constituent quark mass obtained by the solution of the quark dyson schinger equation for the combination of the model interaction and quark guru umbertes ancestors oh okay this plot here uh, is the is for the running quark mass function for different flavor and also for the chiral limits and this plot here illustrate that i said at the beginning of this presentation uh, that the dynamical chiral symmetry breaking plays an eminent role for the light uh, quark sector and it is the phenomenon that transform a light quark into a constituent quark this quark, this red core here uh, illustrate the phenomenon of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking um, this plot show uh, more than this because in the chiral limit that mean uh, no quark mass term in the qcd lagrangian a dynamical quark mass is generated by the interaction of qcd and for the other quarks uh, the effect of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking is gradually attenuated okay the functional behavior for the other model that i present is similar but of course depend on the truncation and for example uh, for the case of the rainbow layer truncation the mass function tend to reach its perturbative limit faster than this model but the common and most more important feature here is that the quark mass function writes a, a fast right and get an inflation point in the range between 1 gb square and 2 gb square that can be traced to the lat of positive uh, definite uh, <clears throat> spectral function of the quark propagator and thus confinement another important thing that we can extract of this plot here and this value here is that dynamical chiral symmetry breaking plays a substantial role even for the charm quarks because it is responsible for the nearly 40 percent it's a constituent mass well this table here uh, summarizes uh, the core result of our exercise and we recover the well-known result of the rainbow layer truncation that the constituent quark mass of the of a light quark is about 98 percent due to uh, dynamical chiral symmetry breaking whereas for the bottom quark uh, it is merely about 50 percent um, from this table uh, this observation is nearly independent of the ingredient used in the quark dyson schinger equation and it is true for the other flavors okay this plot here is an illustration of the evolution of the renormalization point in variable ratio as a function of the renormalized 
quark mass. And from this, we observe that this ratio experience a rapid rise between the, <clears throat> the mass region of the strange and the charm. Uh, another thing is that an inflection point is around two, 220, followed by an, in <clears throat> uh, an inflection point around this, this value. Uh, and this value of 0 0.5, which means uh, equal contribution of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking and explicit chiral symmetry breaking occur, uh, <clears throat> occur at, the, at this value. This is for the case of the leading truncation. And for the other <clears throat> truncation, this is the behavior or the evolution of this parameter. And from this, we, we, we have the, the fair conclusion that this ratio proves to be largely independent of the detail of the integral <clears throat> kernel in the quark dyson schwinger equation. OK, for the case of the slanoff taylor vertex, we, we treated this in, in some way different. And the first thing is that we choose a renormalization scale mu equal to 4.3 GeV at which the unquenched dressing function uh, were renormalized. This is the numerical value that we employed. And <clears throat> this is the result that we obtained for this case. And <clears throat> for this, we see that the contribution of the explicit chiral symmetry breaking for a light quark is more important than the result that I showed you previously. But it is important to uh, note that here we get, for example, a lighter Euclidean constituent quark mass. But as I said before, uh, it is important to mention that uh, <clears throat> in the slanoff taylor vertex, this minimal slanoff taylor vertex, a relevant tensor structure responsible for dynamical chiral symmetry breaking uh, were left out. Yes. OK, this is the result for, for that case. And in this case, uh, this ratio initial is literally linear. And the inflection point occur around 400 MeV. And equal contribution of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking and explicit chiral symmetry breaking occurs at this value. OK, final remark. Uh, in this exercise, we had investigated for which range of the current quark masses the balance of explicit chiral symmetry breaking and dynamical chiral symmetry breaking is comparable in the dependent of fair I choose non-perturbative uh, gluon interaction model, an answer for the dress quark gluon vertex, and a dyson schwinger equation kernel based on a minimal vertex from slanoff taylor and lattice gluon and Gauss propagator. Uh, and as we see, this occurs somewhere midway between the strength and charm mass and fairly independent of the ingredient of the quark dyson schwinger equation. Uh, this ratio proved that to be largely independent of the detail of the integral kernels in the quark dyson schwinger equation. And we found that equal contribution of the explicit chiral symmetry breaking occur around 400 MeV. And we went a step further and extend this study to the GATT equation to the quark gluon vertex beyond the abelian approximation, complete with numerical gluon and Gauss dressing function from lattice. And we obtained that equal contribution of the explicit and dynamical chiral symmetry breaking occur around 220 MeV, which is the range between the strength and quark mass.
Okay, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, let's thank the speaker. We have time for several questions. In your fifth numerical result, you show U and D mass is quite heavy, that right? 400, yes. 400 MeV, something else, for light masses. It's quite heavy, that right? Excuse me? The mass of U and D is quite heavy for Schwinger Dyson solution, no? But what mass? For what case? Which mass? Which mass? U and D. Which mass? U and D. Which mass? U and D. Ah, because. Because it's to be consistent to that is uh, resolved. If you use a small uh, mass, you can get, you never get dynamical chiral symmetry breaking. This is what the quark loops are in, in the lab simulation, so we use this. They were normalized exactly the same way. More questions? In the beginning, you mentioned that the, the important uh, the important assets of QCD are dynamical current symmetry breaking on the one hand and confinement on the other. Of course, what is also interesting in, in your study with all these different vertex models would be to look at the analytic structure of the quark propagator. Yes. And you could do that easily without even having to do a calculation in the complex plane by taking your, your data that you already have and, for example, have a look at the Schwinger function of yeah. the quark propagator and then see how these complex conjugate poles or what, whatever you get um, behave under changes of the flavor, the interaction strength, or the different vertices. I, I don't know, that might be interesting. As well. Oh, good. Okay. You started this, right, looking at the, at the densities. <laughs> more questions? OK, if there's no more questions, let's thank uh, Fabio, no, Fabio. Fernando Sarna. Fernando Sarna. Uh, next speaker is Fabio Bragin from Is it working? It's working. Yeah. It's working. You know, you have a laser here. Very interesting. And with it here, up and down. So, uh, Fabio will talk about pi and, and constant quark effective uh, interaction and constant quark masses. For the beginning. <laughs> Questions? Questions? <laughs> Too much relativistic. Okay, thank you for the organizers for this uh, opportunity to present this work has been developing in the last years. So, uh, Goiania uh, is the capital of the state of Goiás that lies surrounds, is the state that surrounds the capital, Brasilia. I've been working there for eight years, around eight years. So I'll just say some words on the motivations. The motivations are very broad and general, so everybody uh, has these motivations in mind in this, in this field. So uh, we do not measure the fundamental degrees of freedom of the quantum chromodynamics, we just measure Adrons in nuclear uh, effect phenomena. 
So uh, one of the uh, main curiosities we have, how to link these two worlds that seem very different from each other. And there are uh, many effects that we could talk about in this, uh, when saying about these uh, relations. And uh, I'll just remind that uh, analytical approaches have been considered for uh, several years. In particular, I will address uh, methods that have been uh, un investigated in the past by several people. And uh, nowadays, they are not really being used. I mean, nowadays, people look for lattice QCD that provides precise, uh, preci are expected to provi provide ultimate numerical uh, predictions. Schwinger Dyson equations and related uh, methods are very powerful. And uh, uh, well, so in spite of all this, I will uh, go back uh, in time to look for some analytical methods. So, uh, then uh, when talking about analytical methods, we take advantage of all the phenomenological information have been uh, collected in laboratories uh, that uh, provided some fundamental ideas that we expect to, to be present in quantum chromodynamics, such as the chiral symmetry in the Nambu realization and it's dynamical symmetry break, uh, breaking. Uh, so uh, this is one of the, as the previous speaker just uh, mentioned or discussed, uh, this is one of the main mechanisms for mass generation uh, for hadrons, in particular uh, nucleons. And then uh, when saying about the, when, when discussing the, uh, <laughs> complicated. Uh, when discussing these uh, general ideas that phenomen phenomenology provides us to, to investigate strong interactions, we have many effective models that allow us to parameterize our knowledge and compare to experiment <coughs> to experimental data. And from this uh, from these models, we can expect to find uh, their. Uh, relation to the quantum chromodynamics, since they work in the hadronic world, in the nuclear world. And then uh, one of these models is the constituent quark uh, model. There's a powerful uh, description of hadron structure, structures and interactions. So in these models, uh, dressed uh, quark are responsible for the hadron masses and for hadron interactions uh, that we observe in laboratories. And one of these models is this model proposed by Weinberg some years ago that inspired in the quark model by Manohar Georgiai and uh, in the large NC Toft expansion. In fact, it's a model that Weinberg proposed to cope these two different descriptions of uh, ADO interactions. So it has uh, constituent quarks here interacting with, uh, uh, with pions by means of a vector coupling. These are constituent gluons. These are the leading uh, chiral perturbation theory terms, the cinetic pion terms, and then the fourth order interactions. And here, the axial uh, coupling of the pion to the constituent quarks. So this model is, it is interesting because it copes two very different, quite different uh, types of model. So it's very difficult to deal, to, to, to use this model that's in fact an effective field theory because it incorporates large NEC and chiral perturbation theory. It's very difficult to provide observables because it has two different sectors, the quark sector and the pion sector. And you have to, since pion sector and the quark sector are, uh, uh, can provide you the full, uh, are expected to provide separated uh, the full description of hadrons, either by means of chiral perturbation theory or by means of uh, quark, so quark mass, model. Yeah? The mass, of, uh, the mass of, the, of, the, of the quark? The mass of the quark? The mass. Yes, this is the mass, the constituent quark mass, yeah. What's the stellar graph to be? Pardon? What's the stellar graph to be? Uh, D is, uh, there is no, no more pointer. There is, there is no light in the point. 
Oh, now it's, no, it's press stronger. Right. Yes, okay, let's go. Press, no. <laughs> okay, press, 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 press. Okay, that's it. We have to do something. You need a new button? Yes. I think so. uh, maybe it's better. It will finish soon. Yes. Okay, uh, I'll try to press harder yeah. here. So uh, this D is a covariant derivative. So it's just a, a derivative of the pion field that's invariant under chiral transformations. Just a, a nonlinear uh, pion derivative, uh, pion derivative, covariant one. Uh, so it's difficult to, to choose the appropriate weight of the two sectors of this model uh, to provide observables. So, and uh, I'm showing this slide. This is, in fact, the end of the talk. So this, I anticipate this is what I get at the end. Acho que agora já trocou. Deixa eu ver. Tá, tá bom. Tá aqui. Valeu. Okay, thanks. Okay. So uh, this is the outline of the talk. Basically, I follow the logics of the the work. So I start with a quark quark interaction in the uh, QCD effective action for quarks. And then I discuss the general ideas of dynamical chiral symmetry breaking and the introduction of light meson fields until uh, obtain a nonlinear pion uh, coupling to constituent quarks and obtain a constituent quark mass from that. And then I can calculate form factors, quadratic average, average quadratic radial, and then eventually contributions for weak magnetic fields. So these are basically in these works here. So this is one of the leading terms of the QCD effective action. This is in, in its place in the generating functional. So we have the cinetic terms, where this M, uh, the free terms, where this M is the current quark masses, and I will take SU2 flavor, so M U equal to MD. And this is a quark-quark interaction, uh, color current, and this is a non-perturbative uh, gluon uh, propagator. And uh, so uh, this way, we take into account somehow, to some extent, the gluon self-interactions. And this is a quark uh, gluon running uh, coupling constant. It will kept, uh, it, kept it constant. Uh, and somehow it can be absorbed in the analysis of the gluon propagator. So uh, this is, a, uh, we, we can expect, this is the leading term of the QCD effective action. We are neglecting here three quark, four quark genuine interactions, so, uh, but we still keep nonlinear effects in the gluon propagator. That's a non-perturbative one. So, so this is uh, this diagram here with this uh, non-perturbative uh, gluon propagator. So, and then we can explore the flavor structure of this interaction by performing a usual fierce transformation. Uh, this we have all these quark currents with all these Dirac and flavor indices, scalar, pseudo-scalar, and iso vector, and all the others with some uh, uh, kernel that come from the gluon propagator R and R bar, the scalar channel and the uh, de Laurent uh, vector channel. And this is uh, very uh, appropriate because we, if we can introduce meson fields, we have, to, uh, we have to take into account all the channels of the Dirac and flavor structures that appears in any quark model. So this is very uh, convenient. These, all these currents are colorless. 
So I am neglecting the colorful uh, currents that come from fierce transformations. In fact, they are, uh, these are the, the colorless currents are leading uh, by a factor one over N, N C. So all the colorful uh, quark currents, uh, they can be taken into account. And eventually, <coughs> I obtain some kind of uh, rich tetrachark uh, structures from the, those uh, non-leading terms, right? But I'm not discuss that now. So uh, now we have a quark field that might be, should be responsible for all the mesons and baryons, and also for the uh, quark-antiquark uh, condensate. So how to introduce, uh, I had to, uh, how to introduce this difference, we have to choose a method. And uh, I, I'm just saying that from now on, the quark field will be uh, decomposed into a background field that will be responsible for the constituent uh, quarks for, for, uh, that will be part of a baryon. And the, and the other meson fields that are in fact quantized ones, the, the quark fields, that will be responsible for meson structures and the quark anti quark uh, chiral condensate. And then, uh, by, uh, by means of the background field, we can just split the, any quark current into two components uh, constituent quark uh, current, cur uh, current and uh, uh, quantized quark or C quark. Uh, current. Uh, this is uh, just the background field uh, method applying to fermions, in fact. And then just assume that constituent quarks uh, can be done like that. This, uh, this is the structure of the constituent quark. So the constituent quark will be a quark with a non perturbative gluon line uh, dressing it. <coughs> And then by means of the auxiliary field, you can introduce all the uh, flavor and Dirac uh, Lorentz, uh, all the flavor and Lorentz uh, meson structures by means of this method. And then we can pick up all these quark-quark interactions and decompose into uh, meson fields by means of this uh, method. And then besides that, we can just uh, uh, remain in the structureless uh, meson sector by assuming that each of the auxiliary fields that are bilocal fields according to these bilocal currents, these bilocal fields can be expanded in an infinite series of local meson fields, being that this infinite series, the, the, they are associated with the, uh, all the meson excitations. For instance, if you take the scalar meson, bilocal, uh, the bilocal uh, scalar meson, it can be decomposed in an infinite series of all the scalar mesons with quark anti quark composition. The leading one would be the lightest one. The lightest, uh, the k equal, k equal zero, would correspond then to the late, late, lightest uh, scalar field, and so on for all the channels. So the scalars, vectors, and axials, and so on. And then, uh, well, here we have the problem of the, of chiral symmetry in the linear realization. By doing that, you obtain a linear realization of chiral symmetry. And then we have to perform a chiral rotation uh, to uh, get rid of the light scalar quark anti quark mesons. And then we obtain a nonlinear theory for pseudoscalar uh, pions and pseudoscalars in general that uh, lead to usual Goldstone boson type uh, interactions, dynamics. Besides that, besides doing this uh, chiral rotation, we can also uh, reduce the ignorance we have about these this auxiliary fields by calculating saddle point equations for each of them. Of course, it is, this, assumes, uh, this assumes we are look, this corresponds to look for this, uh, how these uh, auxiliary fields behave in the vacuum. And we know that the only different, the only non-trivial solution should come from the scalar auxiliary field. So we can have a quark anti quark condensate in the vacuum. And then by means of this scalar field, uh, scalar field uh, solution from this equation that is called the gap equation, uh, we have a correction to quark mass 
uh, to the quark mass in the usual lines of the dynamical chiral symmetry. This is not the constituent quark mass. This is a correction to the mass that will build uh, the mesons for the quark that built mesons. So if this, if this uh, solution for this uh, gap equation in the quark anti quark condensate is inside or outside hadrons, it looks is not, uh, uh, is not really known. About the location of the, I have no opinion, no, no definite opinion. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, but we don't have to assume this condensate is inside or outside. I mean, we have the, the, the extended uh, the extended quantity of uh, the extended object that will come from this calculation is a constituent quark. So, for me, I don't see why. Uh, it makes difference if this condensate is inside the constituent quark or outside. I didn't uh, see uh, if it's possible to locate it from this calculation. So what is your quark condensate? Is it the trace of S? Is it trace of S? It's the usual gap equation. Oh, yes. I don't understand your question. If you have the gap equation, you have oh, I see. Quark so, quark so, quark so this is in the vacuum, in not vacuum. inside. It's everywhere. Yes. Yeah, it might be. Yeah, it seems it is everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's more likely. Yeah. So, and then when, uh, by eliminating this uh, fluctuating quantized quark field. Uh, we can have a, a model that's given by this determinant. This is the uh, quark uh, kernel in terms of this uh, effective mass from the gap equation. And then we have the nonlinear pion uh, terms from the chiral rotation. And then we have a collection of all the constituent quark currents. So J, J, Q with these coefficients come from the constituent quark currents. And then this highly, highly nonlinear, uh, I decide to expand this determinant for, in the case of large quark mass, uh, this mass, né? this mass from the C quarks. Uh, so I'll expand this, uh, this determinant for large quark mass, which can also be the case of large gluon mass, because in this coefficient of the currents, there are kernels that come from the gluon propagator. So to test this calculation, I calculated the pion sector that people have done in the 80s and 90s. So expanding by neglecting the quark currents, uh, I have the expansion uh, that corresponds to chiral perturbation theory. Besides the chiral symmetric terms, I also have the chiral symmetry breaking terms, and I have also the coupling to photon, the electromagnetic coupling to photon from pions. So that's all okay. I have expressions for all these coefficients. But this is not new. It was just to check my calculation. And then I come to the coupling of pions to constituent quark, the leading terms. So there are four types of terms that appear. The, uh, the pseudo-scalar coupling of pion to constituent quark, the scalar coupling, the vector coupling, that's derivative, and the axial coupling, that's also derivative. Uh, these are non-local couplings. I mean, all this structure appears in the uh, coordinate space as well. And uh, uh, I can check all the coupling constants by taking the zero momentum transfer of pi on q equals zero. I have co coupling constant, right? And uh, also a leading term is this term that's a mass term for the constituent quark. So it's a dressed uh, uh, quark. So this is the leading, these are the leading terms. So we have here the constituent quark mass term. It's a Lagrangian uh, uh, mass term for constituent quarks. Here there are the pseudo-scalar, vector, axial, and there are two terms. Uh, this is scalar coupling. 
uh, in terms of z plus and minus, in terms of the usual parameterization of the pion field. And these leading uh, derivative couplings, they have the shape of the, uh, they have the shape of the induced pseudo-scalar coupling that contributes for the axial current by integration by parts of this, uh, the second derivative. This corresponds to a correction to the axial coupling of pi. Uh, momenta, yes, quark momenta is k, e pi on momenta is q. Lar This is the derivative, uh, yes. Yeah, it's mixed, and I apologize. This is, mo this is mixed uh, representation. Yeah, this could be capital Q squared. Sorry. Uh, this again, the same, uh, the same terms, just to separate into scalar and pseudo-scalar coupling, vector and axial couplings. Uh, and with this induced kind of uh, induced uh, vector and axial uh, couplings. All these coupling constants, they are ultraviolet finite. I have here a typical expression for them. So the scalar is equal to the scalar coupling. It has this shape. And the axial coupling is equal to the vector coupling in this level with this shape uh, proportional to NC. F is a pi on uh, normalization, alpha g square, it comes from the interaction of the model, and f1, f2 are these two integrals in momentum space with S0 tilde, the quark kernel, and R bar, the uh, gluon, uh, proportional to the gluon kernel, right? So uh, there, these are manifestation of chirosymmetry, right? Scalar and so the scalar vector and axial couplings of the pion. And then uh, if I collect all these term, terms that I obtain, I have this, uh, the model, the effective theory proposed by Weinberg, uh, and also the split symmetry breaking terms, and uh, the scalar, so the scalar couplings to constituent quarks uh, that are not present in this pion field representation. So to provide numerical uh, results, uh, I chose two gluon uh, propagators. One of them is the Tendimaris propagator that previous speaker also uh, considered. And another one that's an effective confining propagator by corner that's very simple and produce chiral, uh, dynamical uh, chiral symmetry breaking as well. So, this is the constituent quark mass uh, from the Lagrangian, M3. And uh, here I compare all these figures of the two uh, propagators and two values of the gap uh, effective mass, 310, 350. So, so I have two propagators and two uh, mass from gap equation. I compared all these lines with this uh, plus sign here. This is a solution from schwinger dyson equation. Uh, so it's a kind of very uh, sophisticated solution at the rainbow uh, ladder uh, approximation, but still it has uh, the constituent quark mass has the same strength of this uh, schwinger dyson solution. So there are some problems with norm normalization here because of the definition of M3, just that. But the behavior is quite similar. This effective mass from the Lagrangian, it has basically the same shape of the gap equation. However, it's not restricted by the gap equation. So it's not a self-consistent uh, effective mass. It's very easy to receive uh, contributions for, from other effects. And besides that, it's renormalized differently from the effective mass from the gap equation. So I have here, I have no time, but I have here a table of numerical values for the low energy coefficients from chiral perturbation theory and from the, from the couplings compared to experimental uh, or expected values here. And they are 
of the same order of magnitude, right? Uh, for different sets of parameters. Parameters are uh, the get, uh, mass of uh, gap equation for the quarks, and sometimes it's needed a cutoff for the slow energy coefficients. We need a cutoff or to apply any other uh, regularization or normalization uh, procedure. So, but the results are always of the same order of magnitude, and have, here I have some corrections from weak magnetic field that maybe I'll talk about later. This is the axial uh, form factor for two different mass uh, gap in quark, uh, quark mass. Uh, 310, 350, and two gluon propagators. The fit from experimental observables for the nucleon axial, uh, axial form factor is this, uh, the, uh, are in these points of uh, this cross here, so we don't have enough strains, but it's not uh, unexpected because we are comparing nucleon form factor with a constituent quark uh, form factor. But anyway, the normalization, uh, the overall normalization is of the same order of magnitude as well. This is an uh, unusual parameterization, right, for the nucleon axial form factor. Yeah. This mass goes from 1 GeV to 1.2 or something. Yes. So you are taking something from the nucleus? Comparing to, to the constituent quark, yeah. Just to, to have an idea of the behavior. So eventually, all this difference might be corrected with, uh, with the nucleon, stru nucleon structure, right? So I will skip that. I can also do a kind of a truncation of the quark propagator, but I will not discuss that uh, in detail, uh, just uh, by considering some, uh, some truncation that correct uh, behavior for the zero momentum uh, form factor. Uh, in fact, uh, the issue is that this effective mass here, I consider is constant, is a constant constant, uh, is a constant quark mass from the gap equation. And uh, uh, this is not real. I mean, any gap equation has a momentum-dependent solution that I did not consider to plot the, the form factors. So somehow, this truncation corrects this behavior. It's, it acts as, as if the mass were uh, momentum-dependent. And then I have also a pseudo-scalar uh, pion constituent quark coupling compared with uh, parameterization from goldberger Treman and nucleon uh, axial form factor. And, uh, okay, this is the same. Uh, and then if we take the slope at zero uh, pi on momentum, we have the average quadratic radio, and then the chiral relations still are present for the axial and vector one, so the scalar and scalar ones, right? They are still equal. And then I have here the average quadratic radio as functions of the quark mass gap. This is the gap mass. Yeah? Uh, the order of magnitude uh, is close to other estimates of the constituent quark size uh, here in this by Petrons and Volga and Weizen in this dice that's in these uh, years. And then we have here the axial and the pseudo-scalar quadratic uh, radii right? for different sets of gluon propagators and the uh, quark mass from the gap equation. That is this x line, x, uh, this x, horizontal x. So the order of magnitude of pseudo-scalar radii is uh, bigger than the one order larger than the axial quadratic red, 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 uh, radii. So I think I have no time. I have also calculated the quadratic radii by the coupling of the A1 or 
vector meson or axial meson or the row meson as well, it's a lar it provides larger values. And then I think I have no time, but I will discuss the effect of weak magnetic fields on, on these couplings. And uh, just to, to show results, uh, the correction to the axial uh, form factor or the axial, axial uh, quadratic ra radia is much larger than the pseudo-scalar, the correction to the pseudo-scalar uh, quadratic radia. The, the correction to the axial quadratic radia uh, rad radius is of the order of the magnetic field linear, and to the pseudo-scalar uh, quadratic radia is quadratic in the magnetic field. That's weak with respect to the uh, quark mass. OK, so I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> so questions and comments? I actually don't understand. How many four factors for the pi do I have? I have the, number, uh, the same number as the coupling constant I showed You before. measure axial and pseudo scalar, so what's the difference? I don't understand. Uh, here, I have the same number here. I have the, uh, sorry. This is the scalar. This is the pseudo scalar. The, uh, and then the, <coughs> The vector and the axial, right? These are the. Uh, they have the vector of four factor and axial of four factor for the Yes, pi. yes, they are they are equal. They are the same, right? The usual. These are the usual uh, vector uh, coupling of the pi to a, to a quark to a nucleon, and the axial coupling of the pi to a quark also. I just I didn't know that it's possible to have a vector for vector for the pi. I didn't know that. It's, okay. It's fine. I want to ask something. Yeah. You have uh, many parameters, that right? Well, why you fix these parameters? Uh, oh, well, the parameters uh, you can see here. Uh, in this expression, I have the quark gluon coupling constant, g square, mm -hmm. and here the mass, the quark mass from, from the gap equation. That's not a parameter. It's not come of also of the model. And the gluon propagator. These are the only external, uh, the external input I, I need. You not have three parameters, you say? No. How many? Yeah, this one. I mean, the quark gluon coupling constant, g square, uh, the gluon propagator, the full gluon propagator. How many parameters are there? Well, it depends on the propagator. I mean, uh, I have these two gluon propagators. They are all uh, given, yeah. More questions? Okay, so if there's no, there's no more questions, let's thank the, the speaker again. Thank you.